Good morning. Welcome to all of you, and if you're a visitor, I hope that you're made to feel very welcome this morning. Before we begin our time of worship, let me just mention a few things that you need to know about. After this service, there will be a short meeting for uh, anyone who's interested in helping at the community space. We've had this for the last two uh, winters, and we're hoping to do that again. So if you're a church member and you're interested in helping at the community space, I think that meeting will be in the, the lounge just to your left as you go through, go through the, the doors. Yeah, that will be in there. And then we meet this evening again at 6 p.m., continuing in the book of Psalms. This evening we'll be looking at Psalm 30. And that will be followed by Youth Discipleship at the Hopes, if that's relevant to you. You can just take note of that. And then in the week... And we have our home groups. If you're not involved in a home group and you would like to be, just see one of the elders and we can point you towards one. And then next Sunday morning, again, after the morning service, there will be another short meeting on a different topic. Uh, This time it's for any who are interested in a possible ministry to the residents of Pelsall Hall, which as you know, probably is just at the end of the road there, the care home. Uh, very close to us as a church, there is uh, the possibility that we may be involved in some ministry there. Again, if you're a church member and you'd be interested in finding out more about that, not necessarily committing yourselves at this stage, but just finding out more, just uh, mark in your diary for after the morning service next Sunday. And then we've been mentioning for several weeks our church meeting, which is Thursday, October the 3rd. I think the agenda that was emailed out and that was put on the backboard actually says the 4th, but it is Thursday the 3rd, and I think we'll, we'll send out another email to correct that. But just make a note of that, 7.30 p.m. Back in March, we as a church approved the idea of pursuing developments to our building, That was with the goal of developing our ministry as a church in various ways. And at our church meeting on October the 3rd, we will have a specific plan to present to you for your consideration and your feedback before we uh, make any decision to go ahead with that. So I encourage you, if at all possible, uh, to come on October the 3rd. If you're not a church member, you're still welcome to come and hear about uh, what goes on. Then the last thing I need to mention is uh, we are planning soon to have a baptism service. So if you're interested in baptism or you want to find out what baptism is about, uh, do speak to one of the elders and we'll have a chat to you about that. In the beginning of the uh, New Testament account of Jesus' life written by Mark, Mark tells us this. Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Something new was happening in the ministry of Jesus Christ, but it was not something that was unexpected. We'll see later this morning, the arrival of God's kingdom was long expected. It had been promised long before. And with that in our minds, let's turn to God and speak to Him in prayer. Oh God, we thank You that all Your good promises are fulfilled in Your Son, Jesus. Your promises are yes in Christ Jesus. This morning we meet in his name. We approach you in his name. He is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. He is our hope. We find our rest and our peace in him alone. So we ask you to help us this morning. As we come in his name, help us to look to him together. Will you teach us about him, your precious son? Show us his goodness, his greatness, 
Will you draw us to him? Bring us to faith in him. Increase our faith in him. We ask that by your Holy Spirit, you will do the work in each one of us that you need to do. And we pray that you will be glorified in all of this. Amen. Amen. Let's praise God as we sing, Come People of the Risen King.
It's my privilege to introduce you to a family this morning who have been here before, and some of you may have met them and recognize them, but most of you probably don't. But they're going to tell us about something uh, which, with God's help, they're hoping to uh, undertake in the next while. I'm going to let them tell you about that. But uh, I'm going to invite uh, Joe and Natalie Standerwick to join me at the front now. And I'll let you work from this mic. So it's a pleasure to have you with us, Joe and Natalie, and uh, maybe you could just begin by telling us a little bit about yourselves and your family. Yeah, hi everyone, morning. Um, we do see a few faces we recognize, but Joe and I both grew up in Aldridge um, and went to Aldridge Parish Church growing up, so we know a couple of people from those days. Um, and then Joe lived in Pelsall for a few years, um, and I worked as a vet in Brown Hills for a few years, so we're quite local. Um, and then our parents both moved to Tamworth, uh, which is where they live now. Um, when we got married, we both moved to Lancaster um, and have basically stayed there ever since, um, apart from three years in London when Joe went to Oak Hill Bible College and then we moved back to Lancaster. So at the moment, um, I'm mainly at home looking after these four, um, and then I work one day a week as a vet, so that's quite nice, uh, part-time. <laughs> and Joe is the student, the student pastor at the church we go to, which is called Moreland's Evangelical Church. So that's a, about the same size as this church, an evangelical church in the centre of Lancaster, which has two universities, so a big student population, lots of coming and going, um, lots of young families there. So that's us. Oh, and this is Sophie, who's eight, Isla is six, Harry's four, and Jack's three, so that's the rest of the gang. <laughs> so Joe, uh, you're not planning to stay in, Lan in Lancaster, so could you maybe just tell us a little bit of what, what you are planning to do? Yeah, sure. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, yeah, our plan um, next September is to start a new church in Tamworth. Um, so we're working towards a church plant um, in that place. Um, and yeah, we want it to be, we're going to be called Grace Church Tamworth, um, mainly because we want the message of God's grace to be right at the heart of what we're doing. You know, that song that we've just been singing, the Lord Jesus taking um, our place on the cross under God's punishment so that we might be free. We want that to be right at the heart of what we do as a church and sharing many of the distinctives that, that you do here so that, you know, the authority of the Bible, wanting to teach the Bible to people, wanting to reach new people with the gospel, uh, reach the community of, of Tamworth. Um, so at the moment we're sort of uh, trying to recruit a, a launch team to start this new, uh, brand new church. We had our first meeting on Zoom uh, this week on Tuesday and we had 11 adults there and a 12th who uh, wanted to be there but couldn't. So we've got a, a kind of start of a team of about 20 people if you include children um, and we'd love to have more um, who start that new work. Um, so the plan is, yeah, next September, new church in Tamworth to try and reach the people of that place with the, with the gospel. Thank you. And in the meantime, how can we be praying for you as a church and yeah, sure, uh, yeah. for you as a whole family? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we'd love your prayers because obviously this is quite a big new thing that we've not done before. Um, please pray that as a family we would um, be on mission together and that it wouldn't just be something Joe does or Joe and I, but that it would be a great chance um, for the children to see what the gospel is what it does, and that they would really grow, um, and we would grow yeah, together. Um, please pray, obviously, with some people moving from Lancaster, some from London, and us moving. There's quite a lot of practicalities to pray for, lots of people needing new jobs, houses, mortgages, charities, lots of uh, yeah, things to sort out. So just pray that that would go smoothly and wouldn't get in the way of us um, thinking about other things. That would be great. And if I could just add, I mean, the big reason we're going is there's about 80,000 people in Tamworth. So if you could pray for those people of that town, 
Uh, we feel a real burden um, for those people. We want them to know the Lord Jesus that we know. Um, and so pray, pray for the, the people of the town. Um, we, we also, we think Tamworth is a great place to go, partly because there's other opportunities around the area we think to maybe plant other churches in the future. Um, and I know we're at the moment very, very small as a kind of church plant, but we'd love to in 15, 20, 30 years time be able to support other churches being planted in the area. Um, so even praying for that now would be, would be fantastic. Um, and just for more people to join the team and to partner with us in this work, we feel very small and fragile, um, and, uh, but we trust in a big God, don't we? So praying for more people, more support, uh, finances and all that to be able to get this off the ground would be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Thanks to both. Well, we hope to be hearing more from the Standerwicks in the future, and we as a church certainly want to support them in uh, whatever way we can. And one way we can do that in the... Uh, immediate situation is to pray for you as a family and the plans that you have. So let's pray together now. <coughs> Father, we thank you for continual evidence that you are building your church all around this world. Uh, in every place, your kingdom is uh, advancing, and we're thankful for signs of that, and we thank you for uh, what uh, Joe and Natalie have just shared with us about their uh, plans and hopes for a gospel witness in Tamworth. We realize that uh, throughout their lives and their history, you have been preparing them for this, and we know that you will continue to equip them. But we do pray for that. We pray that as a family, uh, all of them will be blessed throughout this period of uh, transition we know it's exciting in many ways and probably daunting in a lot of ways as well. So we pray for all of them that you will give them peace and joy and strength and wisdom throughout this period. We pray that too for Jack and Isla and Harry and Sophie. We pray that as a, as a whole family together, they will grow in grace and in the knowledge of your son, Jesus. Father, we pray for the needs that have been mentioned. We pray for these uh, months ahead that you will uh, go before them and the things that need to come together. We thank you for the group that has already met uh, online. And we pray that all those who uh, hope to be part of this will be able to be. We pray that there will be a good uh, launch team formed. We pray for um, other elders to be able to be found as well. We pray for the finances that need to come together. And we pray ultimately for a thriving fellowship of believers in Tamworth. We pray that there will be a, a community of your people there that is a compelling witness to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. We pray that even now your spirit will be at work in the lives of people who begin to sense their need for Jesus, even before the church has begun to be planted. And Father, we pray also for uh, the gospel witness and the power of the gospel to be seen in a completely different part of the world, in Uganda, as our brother Gerald Tanner is ministering there in these weeks. Uh, we thank you that this past week's training was blessed, as Gerald uh, just has reported to us this morning. We thank you for that. And we pray for uh, him and Emmanuel Magambo tomorrow as they travel to the venue of the second conference in Tubur. We pray for Gerald especially as he will be the one driving to this new location. We pray for safety for him and Emmanuel as they travel. We pray that they will have a blessed time with this uh, new group of around 45 pastors. We pray for these brothers who, uh, according to Gerald, have no previous training in teaching the scriptures or gospel ministry. Father, we pray that these brothers will benefit greatly from this conference we pray that the material will um, be something they can take hold of and take home and put into use. We pray that your spirit will be at work there. We pray that you will supply uh, Gerald and Emmanuel with everything that they need, the strength physically, mentally, spiritually, uh, to be able to equip these brothers. And Father, we pray for us here in these moments ahead of us, as we have already brought you our praise and our songs, we pray now that as we turn to your words, you will encourage us, pray that you will inspire us, 
and challenge us with a fresh view of your kingdom. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. At this point, the Sunday school are going to move next door to look at God's word together there. Each week, we've been turning to the book of Isaiah together. And last week in the book of Isaiah, we heard Isaiah the prophet give this message to the city of Jerusalem. Isaiah said, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. That's a promise. God will be gracious. He will rise up to show compassion. But the first word of that verse reminds us, all is not well in Jerusalem. The people of the city are not in a right relationship with God. In the chapter before this promise on the screen, God said about the people of Jerusalem, these people come near to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. And one evidence of their hearts being far from God is when they face the threat of invasion by the Assyrians, their first impulse is not to seek God. Their first impulse is to go down to Egypt. It's to look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. And that is why the promise on the screen begins with the word, yet. The Lord's grace and compassion will come. They will not come to a people who deserve them. They will come to people who don't deserve them. People who bring all sorts of bad consequences on themselves because their hearts are far from the Lord. But still, the promise has been made and God keeps his promises. And what we find in our passage this morning is this promise is fleshed out for us. We're told the Lord's grace and compassion will bring about a kingdom that is unlike, very unlike, the kingdom of Isaiah's day. And as we hear about the goodness of this kingdom, our best response is to pray the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Your kingdom come. So if you have a Bible, turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 32. If you're using a church Bible, it's page 717. In the larger print Bibles, you'll find it on page 1108. Isaiah chapter 32, and we'll read the whole chapter. See, a king will reign in righteousness. And rulers will rule with justice. Each one will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm. Like streams of water in the desert. And the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. Then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed. And the ears of those who hear will listen. The fearful heart will know and understand. And the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. No longer will the fool be called noble, nor the scoundrel be highly respected. For fools speak folly. Their hearts are bent on evil. They practice ungodliness and spread error concerning the Lord. The hungry, they leave empty. And from the thirsty, they withhold water. Scoundrels use wicked methods. They make up wicked, evil schemes to destroy the poor with lies, even when the plea of the needy is just. But the noble make noble plans, and by noble deeds they stand. You 
women who are so complacent. Rise up and listen to me. You daughters who feel secure, hear what I have to say. In little more than a year, you who feel secure will tremble. The grape harvest will fail and the harvest of fruits will not come. Tremble, you complacent women. Shudder, you daughters who feel secure. Strip off your fine clothes and wrap yourselves in rags. Beat your breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vines and for the land of my people, a land overgrown with thorns and briars. Yes, mourn for all the houses of merriment and for the city of revelry. The fortress will be abandoned. The noisy city deserted. Citadel and watchtower will become a wasteland forever. The delight of donkeys, a pasture for flocks. Till the Spirit is poured on us from on high. And the desert becomes a fertile field. And the fertile field seems like a forest. The Lord's justice will dwell in the desert. His righteousness live in the fertile field. The fruit of that righteousness will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. My people will live in peaceful dwelling places, in secure homes, in undisturbed places of rest, though hail flattens the forest and the city is leveled completely. How blessed you will be, sowing your seed by every stream and letting your cattle and donkeys range free. This is God's word. And it begins with a promise in verse 1. See, a king will reign in righteousness. Who is this king? Well, if we looked through a list of Old Testament kings, we would certainly find some decent ones in that list. But none of them could be described as reigning in righteousness. At least not without significant qualifications to that statement. The present king of Jerusalem, Hezekiah, he is in many ways a very decent king. But as we'll see in a few weeks, his reign was not one of unqualified righteousness. The only candidate for the king mentioned in verse 1 is the king we've heard about earlier in the book of Isaiah. The one whose birth was prophesied in chapter 7. We were told there, this son would be called Emmanuel. God with us. In chapter 9, he was announced as the one who would fulfill the ancient promise to David, that a descendant of David would reign forever. Chapter 9 told us this king would be called Mighty God. We were told in chapter 9, his reign would be a reign of justice and righteousness. And now here in chapter 32, we are told more about the reign of this king. His kingdom will be a kingdom of security, care, clarity, and character. Have a look again at verse 1. See, a king will reign in righteousness and rulers will rule with justice. Rulers are officials. So we're being told the whole government of this king will be just. We've said the current king of Jerusalem and Judah is Hezekiah. And apparently Hezekiah faced problems in implementing the good things that he wanted to do. Those problems came about because his officials were not on board with Hezekiah's program of righteousness and justice. But we're told the government of this king will be different. His commitment to righteousness and justice will not be thwarted or frustrated by anyone. The beginning of verse 2 seems like it's still talking about the officials of the king, but literally the beginning of verse 2 says, a man will be like a shelter. This is talking about the king himself. The thing said in this verse cannot truly be said about any other man. But they can be said of this man, because as we learned earlier in the book, 
This man is God with us. Emmanuel. He is the unique, special man. And what verse 2 is telling us is that his kingdom will be a kingdom of security and care. Like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm. Security. Security that Jerusalem has gone looking for in Egypt, but is never going to find in Egypt. Security is only truly found in the kingdom of this king. And the same goes for care. The experience of his care is like streams of water in the desert. It's like the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. The shadow of a great rock is a place to be refreshed from the blazing, oppressive heat. And these images in verse 2 are telling us not just what the king provides, they're actually telling us who he is. He is like a shelter and a refuge. He is like streams of water and a place of shade. In his kingdom, he's the source of his people's security. He's the provider of his people's care. He doesn't just point us to where we will find those things. They are found in him. Verses 3 and 4 tell us more about the reign of this king. His kingdom will be a place of clarity. And don't we desperately need clarity? Clarity. Don't we live in a world where people don't really know what's up and what's down? People think they have to create their own reality. They have to invent their own truth. But listen to how different it is in the kingdom of this king in verse 3. Then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed, and the ears of those who hear will listen. The fearful heart will know and understand. And the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. In the context of what we've heard in previous chapters of Isaiah, verse 3 is talking about spiritual eyes and spiritual ears being opened. In chapter 29, we heard that God's word was a closed book to the people of Jerusalem. They couldn't receive it. But chapter 29 promised there would be a future day When the spiritually deaf would hear and the spiritually blind would see. And now we're told that will be the experience of those in the kingdom of this king. God's word will no longer be a closed book to them. They will hear and see the truth of it. And it will make a difference. In verse 4, the fearful heart might be better translated as the hasty heart. Or the rash heart will know and understand. Those in the kingdom of this king will be guided by God's word. Instead of being impetuous and hasty, instead of blundering through life blindly and chaotically, they will have a sure guide. Last week we heard God will be the teacher of his people. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. And now we're told that clear guidance will be experienced by those in the kingdom of this king. And they will share this truth that they receive. Verse 4 says, the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. In other words, those who once had only confusing things to say, They will have the clear truth in their mouths. And one big area of clarity will be the issue of character. Look at verse 5. No longer will the fool be called noble, nor the scoundrel be highly respected. For fools speak folly. Their hearts are bent on evil. They practice ungodliness and spread error concerning the Lord. The hungry they leave empty, and from the thirsty they withhold water. Scoundrels use wicked methods. They make up evil schemes to destroy the poor with lies, even when the plea of the needy is just. 
But the noble make noble plans, and by noble deeds they stand. The contrast in these verses is between fools and scoundrels and the noble and respected. In the Jerusalem of Isaiah's day, there was confusion about which was which. And that confusion carries on in our society today, doesn't it? In the Bible, a fool is not someone who has a low IQ. It's not about lack of education either. Foolishness is not about a lack of brain power in the Bible. In the Bible, a fool is someone who turns away from God's wisdom. And if there's a difference between a fool and a scoundrel, Maybe it's that a scoundrel is a fool who then goes on to live in defiance of God's wisdom. Living in ways that are opposite to God's wisdom. But what verse 5 is implying is that often in society, fools are called noble. And scoundrels are highly respected. Someone who the Bible recognizes as a fool and a scoundrel can appear intellectually brilliant. Their personality can be very attractive. They can be successful, they can be persuasive, they can be envied by all those around them. It's very possible for that to happen. People want to be them. Society elevates them as noble and respectable. If we want to understand that, all we need to do is consider the celebrities of our day. The people society elevates and applauds. The people whose lives we follow with interest. And often we probably think it would be great to be them. And yet how many of them would be characterized by the Bible as fools and scoundrels? Because they reject God's wisdom and they live in outright defiance of his word. And often it's not harmless defiance of God's word. As if defiance of his word could ever be harmless. But how often does it come to light those seen by society as noble and respectable are actually doing evil. As verse 6 describes. They're fleecing the hungry and thirsty instead of helping them. How many highly successful men and women have built their success and their high standing through ruthless cheating and exploitation? And they hold on to their high standing by the same methods that got them there in the first place. Wouldn't the post office scandal recently, wouldn't that be an example of this? Doesn't it fit verse 7 perfectly? Scoundrels use wicked methods. They make up evil schemes to destroy the poor with lies, even when the plea of the needy is just. There are plenty of examples of what verses 5 to 7 are talking about. Where we treat the wealthy and successful as noble and respectable just because they're wealthy and successful. In contrast to that, verse 8 says, in the kingdom of King Emmanuel, what will count is character. The noble make noble plans, and by noble deeds they stand. In Emmanuel's kingdom, what matters is not money and position. What counts is not giving the appearance of caring or the appearance of generosity. What counts in this kingdom is reality. Not planning how we can appear to be good, but actually planning to do good and then actually doing it. The the king mentioned in Isaiah 32 reigns over a kingdom where character matters. 
where true nobility matters more than the appearance of nobility. Well, where is this kingdom? Where is it visible? Where do you find it? It was not visible in Isaiah's day. It was future to Isaiah's day. It's being foretold here. In Isaiah's day, the king we're talking about was yet to come. But we know from the New Testament, the king mentioned here has now come. Jesus Christ is Emmanuel. The first chapter of the New Testament tells us that. He is the descendant of David who will reign forever. His kingdom is the kingdom of security, care, clarity, and character. And according to the New Testament, his kingdom is not a place you'll find on the map. His reign is seen everywhere. Men, women, and children turn to him in repentance, admitting their sin and seeking forgiveness through him, seeking their rest in him, trusting their lives to him. That's where you see the kingdom of this king. Those are the people who find true security. Those are the people who experience his care. Those are the people who see the truth with clarity. Not in the sense of being know-it-alls. No, in the sense of seeing the truth and goodness of God. Seeing the wisdom of his word, seeing the joy of obeying him. And those who turn to Jesus begin to be transformed into people of character. Under the reign of King Jesus, appearances matter less and less. Who you really are matters more and more. Wealth and success matter less and less. Honoring God in all things matters more and more. And please note, we are not talking here about heaven. Not yet. We know from verse 2, this is a situation where life still brings winds. It still brings storms. We still often feel like we're living in a desert. A thirsty land. Circumstances can often be tough. But in the midst of tough circumstances, we find true security in our King. We experience true care from our King. Do we have clarity on every single question? Is every single question answered here and now? Does every decision come easily? Is every dilemma solved by just turning a few pages in our Bible? No. But as we slow down and listen to God's Word, with a desire to see and hear what our King is saying, then we do experience his guidance. He does prove to be the teacher who walks with us and guides us. And because we're not talking about heaven here, we also know we're not talking here about flawless character. The church of Jesus Christ is made up of those who willingly submit to him as king. The church is where his kingdom is present on earth. And don't you and I know only too well, even in the church of Jesus Christ, we do not see flawless character. In fact, can any of us here, can any of us say we have never fulfilled the biblical definition of a fool? Most of us would have to admit we've been scoundrels as well. Ungodly is the word used in verse 6. None of us can claim flawless character. But, while that is true, it's also true that in the kingdom of Jesus Christ there is clarity on what constitutes foolishness. And ungodliness on the one hand, and what constitutes true nobility on the other hand. 
In the kingdom of Christ, there is no ambiguity about those things. There's never a suggestion that wealth and success by themselves make you a noble person. There's never any suggestion that faking a noble character is just as good as having a noble character. Our king loves us, and in his love, he never panders to our foolishness and our ungodliness. He's always calling us out of our foolishness. He's calling us away from our ungodliness. He's always calling us to be more like him. Noble, not just in appearance, but in reality. Noble in our character. Noble in our plans and our deeds. And yes, one day those in Christ's kingdom will be perfected in character. And we will see and hear our king with perfect clarity one day. But already, under his reign, we are not what we used to be. His work in us is underway. Already his reign is beginning to work itself out in us. It's quite possible, though, that to some of us here this morning, this all might sound like something that's interesting, but not really crucial. Because life for us, we feel, is okay, actually. We're not experiencing any storms to speak of. Life doesn't feel like a desert for us. It's pretty comfy, actually. Pretty prosperous. And we're quite satisfied with our view of life as well. We're pretty sure that we know what's right and wrong. We're also pretty sure we're not doing what verse 7 talked about. We're not using any wicked methods. Nor are we destroying the poor with lies. Other people are doing that, but we're not. We feel good about ourselves. And life outside the reign of King Jesus seems fine. Well, if that's how you're feeling this morning, then Isaiah has a message for you in verse 9. It might not initially seem like a message for you, but it is. Verse 9, you women who are so complacent, rise up and listen to me. You daughters who feel secure, hear what I have to say. In little more than a year, you who feel secure will tremble. The grape harvest will fail and the harvest of fruit will not come. Tremble, you complacent women. Shudder, you daughters who feel secure. Strip off your fine clothes and wrap yourselves in rags. Beat your breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vines, and for the land of my people. A land overgrown with thorns and briars. Yes, mourn for all the houses of merriment and for the city of revelry. The fortress will be abandoned, the noisy city deserted. Citadel and watchtower will become a wasteland forever. The delight of donkeys, a pasture for flocks. The message of these verses is we are to wake up from complacency. False security will collapse. But of course, when we read these verses, the obvious question is, why is Isaiah picking on the ladies of Jerusalem? Well, this is only the second time in 32 chapters he's singled out the ladies. The first time was back in chapter 3. There, the ladies were called out for focusing only on outward superficial beauty, not caring at all about character. And so, given what we've just been hearing about character, there may be a connection there along those lines. But the main point here is simply that these ladies are assuming their current situation will go on indefinitely. And their current situation is good, it's comfy. Yes, there is stuff in the news about a possible attack from Assyria. Yes, there are envoys going back and forwards to Egypt trying to make some sort of political deal. That's all going on, but it seems pretty remote. Life in Jerusalem is still okay. Their lifestyle is fine, probably more than fine. 
Why should they care about the king and the kingdom Isaiah is speaking about? They're complacent. To be complacent is to be self-confident and without any cares. But they have no cause to be complacent. Verse 10 says, In little more than a year, their security will be rocked. The grape harvest will fail. That seems to be a reference to the Assyrian invasion, which will destroy the harvest. And it will impact their lifestyle in a big way. But that won't be all. Verse 14 speaks about a later, much more devastating event. The fortress will be abandoned. The noisy city deserted. Citadel and watchtower will, be, will become a wasteland. The upheaval that's going to start with the Assyrians will end with the Babylonians and exile. Life is not just going to go on as normal. And in verses 11 to 13, the ladies of Jerusalem are called to put on mourning clothes. And this is probably the main reason ladies are singled out here. Because when there was mourning to be done, it was the ladies who did it. And that wasn't just because it was a cultural tradition. The ladies were usually the ones hardest hit by the suffering that came with invasion and defeat by foreign enemies. They were the ones who lost their husbands and their sons. The comfortable world of these ladies in Jerusalem is about to be overtaken by severe storms. Their security is a false security. And soon it's going to collapse. They need to wake up from their complacency. And this morning, if any of us are outside the kingdom of King Jesus, if we haven't yet willingly come under his reign, then we need to wake up from our complacency. Because outside of Christ's kingdom, we have no reason to be complacent. No matter how stable our lives seem, we are not secure. And time will prove that. Because even if life stays comfortable right up to the point of our death, it will most certainly not be comfortable after death. After death, when we meet King Jesus, not as our Savior, but as our judge. On that day, we will not be able to talk our way out of the wrath we deserve. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is our only way to escape the wrath we deserve. If we refuse to come to him in repentance, if we refuse to rest in his work to save us, then we will not be saved. We will experience God's wrath. And that wrath has been described in previous chapters of Isaiah as a blazing furnace. The kingdom described in verses 1 to 8 is not just a nice thing to think about. It's crucial for all of us. Our only salvation is to come under the reign of Christ Jesus the King. And when we do, we find that living in Christ's kingdom is not a matter of just trying to be a better person. Many people view Christianity that way. Come to Jesus, he'll forgive you, then he expects you to be different. Turn over a new leaf, improve yourself. It's your job once you've come to Jesus. Now, of course, Jesus does expect us to be different. And his love, God accepts us as we are, however we are. But he does not intend us to stay as we are. That would be miserable. The kingdom of God is about people being forgiven and changed. We've noticed that in verses 3 to 8. But 
We also need to see this is not about us changing ourselves. It's not about us being changed by our own power. In his kingdom, God himself supplies the power for change. And here in Isaiah 32, the final verses explain that the transforming spirit brings the life of the kingdom. Verse 14 has just explained how the history of Jerusalem is going to unfold. There will be defeat. The city will be deserted. That's a message we've heard plenty of times already in this book. In the future, Jerusalem's refusal to repent will bring the city to the point of no return. The people will go into exile. But there will be more to the story. Verse 15 begins with the word, till... Until the situation of desolation will continue until the Spirit is poured on us from on high. The Holy Spirit is mentioned often in the New Testament. He is the one who empowers people to serve God. But it is only the prophets who speak of the Spirit in this way. Promising that one day the Spirit will be poured out on God's people. And in the New Testament, the book of Acts describes how this promise was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was poured out on Jesus' followers. But the New Testament goes on to say that was not a unique privilege for those first group of disciples. All who come to Jesus, the New Testament says, are baptized by the Holy Spirit. And that is exactly what's foretold here in our passage. In verse 15, the picture is of people being totally soaked with the Spirit, with the result that they are made new. Verse 15 describes that in terms of a desert being made fertile. But in fact, this is about transformed people. It's about people who display the Lord's justice and righteousness. You can see that in verse 16. Those who have the Spirit poured out on them begin to be changed right through from the inside out. So they begin to display the character of their king from the inside out. And in verse 17, they begin also to experience the peace and the quietness and the confidence that God's presence brings. They experience the security that God's presence brings. Security that is not shaken even when their lives are very badly shaken. Notice how verse 18 talks about security and rest, even though, verse 19, things are falling down around us. Hail flattens the forest and the city is leveled completely. So we're not being promised That once we're in the kingdom of the king, once the spirit has been poured out on us, life will then be a walk in the park. Not at all. We're being told life might often be a walk in a hailstorm. But we heard earlier, our king is a shelter for us. He's a refuge from the storm. His care is like streams of water in the desert. It's like the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. So after the storm and upheaval mentioned in verse 19, that's why verse 20 returns to the description of God's people flourishing. Now in purely physical terms, the pictures in verses 18, 19, and 20 cannot be merged. They can't hold together. But this is picturing the reality of God's kingdom. Under the care of our king, with the power supplied by the Spirit, the picture makes sense. The picture illustrates the truth that disasters may well come. But through his Spirit, our king supplies all we need. 
And so one writer has summed up the message of Isaiah 32 by saying, the lordship of Christ and the outpouring of the Spirit are the secret power of God's people. And nothing else is. If you're investigating Christianity, please understand, Christianity is not about you and me turning over a new leaf. It's about coming into the kingdom of God's king. Becoming part of his new society, the church of Jesus Christ. Christianity is about being changed by the supernatural power of God. So that little by little, as we are cared for by the king, as we are empowered by the spirit, we become more and more like the king. So if you're trusting in Jesus as your king, then you are blessed. You are secure in his care. And he calls you every day to keep in step with the spirit who's at work in you. The spirit who's working in you to produce fruit that honors the king. To produce character that reflects the king. Have you understood that? Have you grasped that? About life in Christ's kingdom? Are you longing and praying for the character of the king to be formed in you? In dependence on the Holy Spirit, are you pursuing pursuing truly godly character rather than just the appearance of godly character? And if you are not yet trusting in Jesus, it's time to stop being complacent. No matter how secure your life seems, there is no actual security outside of Christ's kingdom. Let's pray. Lord God, will you help us? Will you open our eyes? Change our hearts? Will you cause your kingdom to come in our hearts? And in our actions? And in our character? We ask you to carry on the work you've begun in us. We ask you to produce more of the fruit of righteousness in our lives. Let your kingdom come. Amen. Our last two songs give us an invitation to come to Jesus and rest in him. And we're also given words to respond to him as our king, recommitting ourselves to serve his majesty. Let's stand and sing these final songs as a response to God's word.
And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.